Well, I appreciate your attention and your patience uh, thus far today. It has been good to get to know some of you already, and I look forward to the opportunity to get to know more of you as the week progresses. I encourage you to come to all of the sessions this week. Uh, each of these lessons is going to build a little bit off of the previous one, and I think each one is also very unique. Uh, you, you can come for one night, and I think there's plenty there, but it's kind of stacking these lessons one on top of the other that's really going to equip you in your faith. There's also daytime sessions if you're able to make it, and those are going to have a really strong connection to the overall theme as well. This lesson uh, during this hour, I'll consider this my keynote uh, lesson for the week. This is kind of the heart and soul of what I want to get at during this series, and it's about seeking God in the deep water, stretching yourself in your faith, stretching yourself in your thinking, being willing to ask and explore and accept the harder questions and answers about God. It is so easy for us to keep things at a bare minimum and to keep things at a, a superficial level and to just be okay with that, right? It, it's worked for a lot of other people before me and it'll work for people after me as well. So why should I challenge myself? Well, this becomes apparent when you're asked to defend your faith. Because here's the thing, maybe you're okay with cheap and easy answers. Maybe you're okay not even asking the hard questions about God. You know what? God told them to kill the Amalekites, every man, woman, and child, and kill their animals while you're at it. And maybe you're okay saying, eh, whatever, God is God, He can do whatever He wants. Maybe you're okay with earthquakes and hurricanes and natural disasters and saying, you know, I don't understand everything about God and I'm just kind of okay with that. Maybe there are things about prayer, like, well, how come prayer doesn't work? How come I prayed for something with all my heart, and I still didn't get healed? Or my family member did not get better from that illness? And maybe you're okay just not asking that question. But you know who's not is the person at work, or your neighbor, or your son or your daughter who's struggling with those questions. I really appreciate Ben for bringing up Psalm 69 before the Lord's Supper. It's really, really kind of interesting. I did not intend on that having such a connection to my lesson. But as we were reading through Psalm 69, I actually found an element of every single one of my lessons this week in Psalm 69, from seeking after God and desiring God, to praying and feeling like God doesn't always hear me in my prayers, to the strain that gets placed upon us by those who are persecuting us and asking us hard questions, to how do we understand God and His righteousness, His justice, His mercy, and His judgments as well. And so I suppose if you want to go ahead and reread Psalm 69 at some point this week, maybe make that your psalm of the week. Maybe make that your meditation uh, as you're uh, getting ready for work in the morning. Read through Psalm 69. I think you'll be amazed at the, the connections that we see there. Let's start here in Matthew chapter 7. A couple of passages here that talk about seeking after God and what that really means. Matthew 7, verse 7 says, Seek and you will find. Simple enough, right? Do you want God? Well, then seek Him. And guess what? You'll find Him. Great. Face value. Paul said in Acts chapter 17, like we read a moment ago in our scripture reading, that they should seek God, if perhaps they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. Again, at face value, that's great. Seek after God. He's just right there. He's not very far away. And you just seek Him, and you will find Him. And it sure helps also that God wants to be found. In Romans chapter 10, verse 21, quoting from Isaiah, all the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. He wants to be found. Revelation 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and I'll dine with him and he with me. Great. Come forward as we stand and sing. Or is there more to it than that? Because it all sounds so simple that if I just seek God, then I'll find Him. 
So why does it seem so hard in actual practice? Why is it that when I sit down and I talk to my son or my daughter about tough questions from the Bible, why don't they just accept the answer and be okay with it? Why are people so stubborn? And maybe if I really, in a quiet moment of self-reflection, maybe I find myself also having a hard time with it. How come it does not seem so easy in practice? Why are my thoughts still occupied with doubt or fear or anxiety? Why does it feel like I'm looking for God and never finding the answers that are really satisfying? And perhaps one of the reasons that that happens is that we're trying to look for a God who keeps himself into a nice, tidy box. We're very analytical people, right? That's what it is. When when God created man, he set us loose on the world. And you know what we did? We started dissecting things. I always wonder if God's like, no, don't do that. (laughs) Like, don't take it apart. I just made that. But that's what we do. We dissect things. And then we put them into, their, into the animal kingdoms. And we, we divide them up into families and species. And, and we're like, well, oh, hmm, that, that looks like that. But it, it flies like a bird, uh, but it doesn't lay eggs. What are we supposed to do with that? And we're very analytical people. We, we take things and we take them apart and dissect them. We want to understand them. And we do the same thing with God. We want to have a God who fits nicely into tidy boxes that, that we can kind of like totally understand understand everything about him. But God doesn't fit nicely into those tidy boxes. If anything, God strains us and challenges us and pushes us to where we get frustrated with him. There's a quote from a book here. Stott wrote, um, until, let me make sure I've got the right quote here. Here, then, is the crucial question which we've been leading up to. Have we ever opened our door to Christ? Have we ever invited Him in? This was exactly the question that I needed to have put to me, for intellectually speaking, I had believed in Jesus all my life. On the other side of the door, I had regularly struggled to say my prayers through the keyhole. I had even pushed pennies under the door in a vain attempt to pacify him. I had been baptized, yes, and confirmed as well. I went to church, read my Bible, had high ideals, tried to be good and do all of that. But all the time, often without realizing, I was holding Christ at arm's length and keeping him outside. I knew that to open the door might have momentous consequences. And one of those big consequences is to accept that God is inscrutable. That God is unsearchable. That God is bigger than you, smarter than you, more powerful than you. And that you cannot understand God in such a tidy and convenient fashion. Now, can you know everything about God that he allows you to know? Of course. Can you understand everything about God from the right perspective? Of course you can. Here's the analogy about God that I use most often. When we struggle to understand God, I have a dog. I love my dog, Howard the Golden Doodle. He's a great dog. I love him. He's like a child of mine. In some ways, in some ways even better than my kids because he does what I tell him and he goes where I say. (laughs) But the thing about Howard is, does Howard understand everything about me? Of course not. Is he even capable of understanding everything about me? Does he understand why it is I take that weird little flat black thing and do this for an hour at a time? Does he understand why I'm doing it? Does he understand when I take a a stack of pages in, in a book bound together and I sit there and I stare at them and I move one piece of paper to the next? Does he understand why it is that I put these leather things on my feet and tie them on every day? Does does he look at me and there's like a million things about me that my dog is incapable psychologically, mentally, intellectually of understanding about me. But are there things that he can understand about me? Does he know that I care about him? Does he know I'm part of his family? Does he know that I'm the one that gets food from the garage? Does he know to listen to me in a series of commands that he's capable of fulfilling and comprehending to whatever degree he can as a dog? There are things about God that we can know. 
But there's a million things about God that we can't. Because he hasn't revealed them. We're not at his level. We're not capable of understanding them. His judgments are unsearchable. His ways are inscrutable. No one has been his counselor. His greatness is unsearchable. His understanding is unsearchable. Heaven, even the highest heaven, cannot contain him. He inhabits eternity. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> like, what? He inhabits eternity? From everlasting to everlasting, He is God. The depths of God are searched by the Spirit, and the Spirit comprehends the thoughts of God. No one has seen God at any time. God, the only begotten who is at the Father's side, has made known to Him. The love of Christ surpasses knowledge. There is a whole lot about God that I can't understand. But then there are a lot of things that God invites me To understand. You remember from Deuteronomy 29. Great passage. The secret things belong to the Lord. And there's a lot of those. A lot of secret things. But he does say the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever. There are things about God that we can know. But do you accept the invitation to dive into the deep water... And explore those things. God is not a shallow God. We've got to come to understand that. That God is not a shallow God. He's not found in the shallow end of the pool. God is not found in the ankle deep water of a creek or a pond. He's found out in the deep end. With deep thoughts. Deep concepts. And we have to be willing to follow him out into the deep end. If we ever want to understand him. In a great article called There Is No Shallow End of the Theological Pool. I love that. That's a great article, isn't it? Until and unless the weight of God's infinite being is straining your thoughts to the breaking point, until and unless you have felt the finitude of your mental powers in contemplating the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you have not even begun to fathom the unfathomable depths of the one living and triune God. Perhaps... Our biggest problem is not that God is so unsearchable that we cannot know anything about Him. Perhaps perhaps our biggest problem is not that the questions are too hard to understand. Perhaps our biggest problem is not that the questions are just too inconvenient to understand. We just don't want to go talk about them. We just don't want to talk about them. It's just too deep, too hard. And that's what this series is all about. When we get together tomorrow night, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, when we get together for those day sessions, we're not going to hold any punches. We're going to talk about things like God and natural disasters. And how do you reconcile a loving God with hurricanes and earthquakes and even things like diseases, germs, viruses, bacteria? We're going to talk about how do you understand God from Old Testament and New Testament, from all the violence of the Old Testament and battles and slaughtering and, I mean, all those kinds of things with this God of the mercy. We're going to talk about prayer and and does prayer even work and how do you pray to God and just sit there and just nothing happens and the disease doesn't go away and the cancer is never cured and how do you understand that? How about things like Jesus, and how could Jesus be God and man at the same time? And how could Hebrews 5 say that Jesus learned obedience in the things he suffered? Like, you mean the omnipotent God learned things? How do you, and how is God a father to us when he seems so far and so distant? It's those kinds of questions. And I'll tell you what, those are the questions your kids are asking. Maybe they're not asking you. They're too afraid to ask. They're too embarrassed to ask. They're they're not sure what kind of answers they'll get from you. But those are the kinds of questions your kids, your teenage kids are asking, your college-age kids. Those are the kinds of questions. And I'll tell you what, those are the reasons why people leave the faith. Because nobody ever gave them a good answer. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to go into the deep end of the pool. Because the deep end is dark and scary. And I don't want to go there. Will you join me in the deep end? Will you follow after God and go through the deep end? The deep end might be daunting and intimidating, but it is in the deep end that God is going to be found insofar as he allows us to 
be found. But the real question is, how do I do this? That's easy enough to say in theory. How do I go about seeking God in the deep end of the pool? Well, let me give you a few things here, a series of practical applications, and there are five of them. I had to do the math real quick. One thing you'll learn about me is I was an English major in college. I like words. I get along really well with words, but when it comes to math, I struggle. <laughs> Even the basic math, you know, and, and my, my pet peeve, by the way, is when math tries to steal English away from us. Like algebra, that's not fair. That's not fair. You can have all the numbers, but the letters are ours. Stop trying to ask me what a squared plus b squared equals c squared is. I don't care what x means. That's right. So how do I do this? Let me give you five things here. Number one, squeeze yourself through the narrow door. Luke chapter 13, verse 24 says, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. Think about this for a second. He says, strive to enter through the narrow door. He did not say, slide easily through the narrow door. He did not say, accidentally find yourself in the narrow door. He did not say, conveniently walk through the narrow door when you know the doorway is clear and nobody else is in. He says, work at it. Strive. It takes striving. That's what striving is, is to work for something. You have to strive to enter through the narrow door. Do not give up. Do not compromise. Seek God until you find Him, not until you get tired of looking. Seek Him until you've made yourself what He wants you to be, not until you become what you think you ought to be. Like all things that are worth the work, a relationship with God and understanding Him is not accomplished by accident. We also annoy, uh, we need to avoid the trap of thinking that once we have found some element of God, that we don't need to exert any more effort. Like you find one answer to something, you go, whew, glad, glad I finally took care of that one. And then we just kind of become experts in one thing in the Bible. Strive to enter through the narrow door means don't be satisfied with just yesterday's answers, but maybe go a little deeper now. And then once you've answered that question, go tackle another question. Be willing to keep tackling questions as long as you are in this life. Part of seeking Him diligently is remember that being a saved person requires daily effort on your part. Now, being saved didn't require your effort. We know that we are saved by grace and that even in our obedience to the gospel plan of salvation, that that is itself an extension and expression of God's grace. But as a saved person, I'm expected by God to do something, to live a certain way, to pattern and model my behavior. James 1 verse 27, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. To keep oneself reminds us that we could lose our salvation if we do not keep ourselves. Galatians chapter 5 verses 4 and 5 talks about being severed from Christ. You who are trying to be justified by law, you've severed yourself from Christ. So point number one is if you want to seek him, be willing to work really, really hard at these difficult questions. My brother and I were talking about someone recently actually, a friend of ours, who's tackling some of these questions. They're, they're questions she didn't she didn't ask and didn't get good answers to for a long time, and it's really impacted her faith. And one of the things we were talking about is it gets frustrating when you're trying to study with someone and answer these questions, and they just sort of get, like, they get exhausted. And they just get tired, and eventually they just stop accepting the answers at all. You can't let that happen to you. Maybe take a break. You don't have to study all day long, right? Ecclesiastes 12 says that devotion to books is wearying to the body, so be careful about that. But are you striving to enter through the narrow door? Uh, second point here, seeking God. Seek Him humbly. Maybe it should go without saying, but really I think it should go with saying. You have to seek God humbly. 
Pride is a huge hindrance to those who are seeking God. It's one of the reasons that Christ loves children so much. Because children are humble. Children are teachable. We are to become like little children in our attitudes toward God. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20, or Luke chapter 18, 16 and 17. Children are innocent. They are open. They are receptive. Children are not self-important, and they're not critical. Realize that you don't know as much as you think that you know, and learn to accept criticism and accept advice with meekness. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 3 says, the one who guards his mouth preserves his life, the one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. One person, Albert Guinan, once said, there are people who instead of listening to what is being said to them, are already listening to what they're going to say to themselves. This is true in our conversations about God. When you ask tough questions about God, things like violence in the Bible or natural disasters, I have found when I debate those topics with people, as I'm saying my answer, you know what they're doing? They're already disengaging from me and thinking of what the next question is going to be. They don't care about the answer. It's always about the questions. I sometimes challenge people, when I have a Bible study with someone who is particularly stubborn about something, they say, listen, the reason I don't believe in God is because of all these discrepancies in the Bible. And it's all these historical discrepancies and contradictions in the Bible. And I challenge them, I say, present any of them to me, and, and you're agreeing then. You agree that if I give you a satisfactory answer, if I give you a logical and coherent answer to that discrepancy, then you'll believe in God, Right? They don't always like that proposition. Because it's never about the answer. It's always about the question. And if the reason you don't believe in God is because you have questions, I'll tell you what, there will always be more questions to ask. You'll always have more questions that you can ask. We have to humble ourselves and seek after God in a way that seeks the answers, not just more questions questions. Take a look at Jeremiah chapter 6. In Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, I think this is a very telling commentary on a lot of people, myself included. I've made the same mistake before, so I put myself in the, in the spotlight on Jeremiah 6 verse 16 as much as anybody else, but I love this commentary on people's attitude. Jeremiah 6 and verse 16, thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. And so I sent watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. Just shut the conversation down. It's pride that leads us to resent the honest and genuine plea for repentance. And without humility as a guide, we easily become bothered and offended when the truth is peacefully, respectfully presented to us. I'll give you a third path to understanding and seeking God is let God be God. Many people come to the Bible with their minds already made up about something. You talk to uh, atheists, authors, writers, someone like Richard Dawkins, who's very famous for his debates and the books that he writes. And Richard Dawkins already made up his mind. The fact is that he's read the Bible enough times, which is certainly, interestingly enough, he's probably read the Bible as much as a lot of believers have. But he's read the Bible enough times that no matter what you say, to someone like Richard Dawkins and people who think like him, they already made up their mind that God is a, a malicious, capricious, jealous, guilty, angry, petty, small-minded being, and who would ever love a God like that? Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Ooh. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all my heart, or with all your heart. Attitude makes a big difference, doesn't it? Our attitude toward the pursuit of God makes a very, very big difference in terms of the outcome. If you pick up the Bible and all you want is to find little discrepancies in some genealogical figure in the Old Testament... If all you're looking for is like scientific inaccuracies in the story of the Bible, 
You can read the Bible a hundred times and guess what you're never going to come to. You're never going to come to God. Attitude has a lot to do with it. And a big part of letting God be God is allowing Him to remain somewhat mysterious. And there is excitement in the mystery, after all, in letting some things go unspoken because satisfactory answers can never be found until we have an eternal perspective on things. Look no further than the book of Revelation. Poor Apostle John. Apostle John's like, he's like, 90, he's like a 90-year-old man, and he's being shown this glimpse into the, the, the dwelling place in the throne room of God, and, the, and all John can do is like, I mean, I... It's like a rainbow, but it was green. So, you know, it's like, well, it was, it was like an animal, but I, I don't know. It's like, you will never understand God from this side of life, fully. You will never understand everything about God as long as you're this physical being, trapped in this physical world, seeing things with physical eyes from a physical perspective, and and guess what? That's okay. My dog doesn't know everything about me, and he doesn't understand a lot of things. My dog looks at me, and he does that, you know, that cute thing where dogs cock their head to the side? Yeah, Howard does that a lot, because he doesn't understand so much of what I do. But he gets the important things, and he knows I love him. Here's a fourth one. Being known is better than knowing. Go to the book of Galatians chapter 4. There's a little detail in Galatians 4 that is actually like low-key, one of my favorite things from the book of Galatians. But there's a passage here in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 8, and we'll read verses 8 and 9. However, at that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But verse 9, now that you have come to know God, or or rather to be known by God. I love the way Paul interrupts himself there, because now that you've come to know God, or really it's not about knowing God. This whole pursuit is actually about being known by Him. And being known by God is a whole lot better than knowing God. Silly analogy that I think makes some sense here, though every analogy breaks down if you push it too hard. Just kind of a silly analogy, right? Let's say there's a celebrity out there, and you're kind of, like, obsessed with them. Like, let's say, let's say you have a, a whole bookshelf at your vacation home that is all about Elvis, and it's just book after book after book about Elvis. Like, way, a disturbing amount of books about Elvis, okay? You know everything there is to know about Elvis. You know about Elvis, is that the same thing as someone who knew Elvis personally and was known by him? Someone who Elvis would say, yeah, that was a good friend of mine through thick and thin. Elvis would say that that is a person I know. What's better, knowing everything about Elvis or being known by Elvis in terms of just pure relationship? I think I'd rather be known by God. And I'm going to let God be God. I'm going to let the mystery be the mystery. I'm going to let some questions be unanswered. And in my pursuit of God, what I really want more than anything else is to be known by the creator of the universe. He's God after all. What can I possibly know about him compared to what he can know about me? And I need to be content with that arrangement. And the last point is this. Make a decision, for a decision is necessary. There is no sitting on the sidelines in this pursuit. There is no being on the fence and just kind of being non-committal. The fence rider has, in fact, made the decision. For those who are not with God are against Him. Going back one more time, <clears throat> John Stott said, that a decision is necessary in order to become a Christian is an idea quite foreign to many people. Some imagine that they're already Christians because they were born in a Christian country. We cannot remain neutral, nor can we drift into Christianity. We, 
Uh, nor can anybody else decide the matter for us. We must decide for ourselves. We may concede that the evidence for the deity of Jesus is compelling, even conclusive, that he was in fact the Son of God. We may believe that he came and died to be the Savior of the world. We may also admit that we are sinners and need such a Savior, but none of these things makes us Christians. We have to act upon these things. It is no accident that somebody would become a Christian. It was no accident that 3,000 were baptized on the day of Pentecost. It is no accident that the Apostle Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, breathing threats and violence against the church, made a decision when faced with Jesus the Lord and changed his life forever. That's a decision that has to be made. And becoming a Christian is not about simple intellectual agreement or believing facts. It is about discipleship. More than anything else, that's what it means to seek after God in the deep end. It's to just not be satisfied with the cheap and easy answers that come from the world or other religions. But to take God's hand, like Psalm 69 talks about, and going out where it's uncomfortable and challenging and difficult, where there are enemies, where there are dangers, but where we know that God will never let us fall. Now, if you're not a Christian here on this beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day, make this the greatest day ever by becoming a Christian. If you know what you need to do, you've studied through it, you know what the Scriptures say, then it's time to obey. Quit delaying. Quit putting it off until tomorrow, because tomorrow might not... Might, I hope tomorrow comes, by the way, because I think tomorrow's lesson is going to be pretty good. But if it doesn't, you're sure going to be sad that you didn't make a decision today. And if you don't know what you need to do to be saved, ask any of the members here at this congregation. I know that they'll open up their Bibles together with you and show you the truth of the gospel. For he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, verse 16. So whatever spiritual need you might have, I encourage you to come forward and make it known by coming forward as we stand and sing.